I'm an MIT grad. I graduated in 1983, made up my own major in enterprise engineering, and I wrote my first published article as the, uh, uh, for the Futurist magazine. It was actually the cover story of the Futurist magazine uh, 20 years ago, and it was on graphics as the future language of international business. Okay. What does the future have in store? What do you think? Well, I was hoping to focus on the future of the internet, that's, yeah, if that's possible. That's fine. Okay. I think that the future has in store um, an evolving world economy that gets richer in some places and poorer in others uh, as a result of whether countries are importing or exporting learning curves. I think the primary carryaway for learning curves is the internet, and I think so that the future of the internet is of integral importance to the future of human civilization. Um, the future of the internet is bound up very closely with the future of Internet Protocol version 6. Uh, versions 1, 2, 3, and 5 never made it out of the lab. Version 4 is what we have now. It's based on TCP IP, and it's uh, 32 years old this year. But just as there have been so many changes in so many ways, it's time to upgrade the protocol. So IPv6 um, is, a, uh, is different in a number of ways. IPv4 is a 32-bit address. That's so you can make uh, two to the 32nd power number of new unique addresses and give them out. That's about 4.3 billion addresses. IPv4 is a 128-bit address, and so it can create. Um, uh, it uh, it allows you to create two to the 128th power, which is 3.4 times 10 to the 38th power. So 340 trillion is a really really big number, and it's 23 orders of magnitude bigger than that. It also has improvements for mobility, improvements for security, uh, do different ways of putting in packet headers. And so it's almost fundamentally a new way of conveying packets of information around the world. Packets are really good for a number of things like emergency services because that you can store and forward them, you can save them, you can break them up, they can route around damage and all kinds of other things. So what we have though is with IPv6 a very interesting case in inability to imagine the future because it's been around for a while, and outside of Japan, Korea, China, there are no new applications. In fact, um, there are no companies even working on applications uh, except by basically putting it in, let's say, to Microsoft Vista. So uh, I think that one of the, the things that I hope comes out of your future survey, uh, the future of the Internet, is the ability to, to come up with ways in which we can think about using it. What does it all mean, you know, the future of the Internet? What does that mean for the typical Internet user? Well, there are a billion Internet users, so I don't know that one can, one can say anything about Internet users except for on average they make more than $1,000 a year. Uh, so they're, you know, they're wealthier than the poorest people in the world, and we're about to go to, I think, within the next few, let's say, three years, I think we get to 2 billion users on the Internet. But so what does the future of the Internet mean? Well, it means uh, where do you work? How much do you get paid? Who's going to take your job? Who's going to go and send messages to your kids that you don't want to do? What entertainment will you get? How often do you have to go out of the house, especially if there's an avian flu um, epidemic? Everyone will be staying inside and flipping channels around. Um, to what extent do you watch advertising versus select your programming? So fundamentally, the whole human experience, what you take in and what you share out with other people, is, will be influenced more by the Internet than by any other factor. And if you have broadband secure internet, you have the ability to share ideas more freely, to innovate, to, um, to collaborate, to create new polit political structures, even be uh, a dissenter or a rebel or a terrorist. So uh, the internet, internet is one of those solvents that can dissolve organizations and even countries and allow people to reform different kinds of, of heterarchies or you know hierarchies that don't have anyone really in charge for any long period of time so fundamentally they restructure our civilization the internet re restructures our civilization so the future of the internet is the future of you know how of human experience what needs to happen for this this new internet to come into being well governments have mandated it's very much a top-down phenomenon um, and in China Japan Korea um, They've, they know what it takes. It takes money. We spent $50 million funding with federal funding on the first Internet. That's $15 million for the ARPANET and then money for TCPIP and money at NSF. That produces an annuity of $500 billion a year in extra federal revenue alone, federal revenue alone. So, for instance, all this money going to New Orleans 
if nothing new technologically happens, all that money is sunk cost. It's consumption. So I would say actually that the internet is the greatest return on investment of all time. Um, so what does it mean when Japan, Korea, China are putting money into it and we're not? Uh, we put about 10 million into it and it all went mostly to one company that did nothing but make PowerPoints that you have never seen because they're not good enough actually to make it outside of you know, that distribution. So the US has, uh, if you compare the competence level and the enthusiasm level of the future of the internet in you know, Northeast Asia with the United States, it's uh, we're a one uh, on a scale of 100 and they're like up in the 90s. So what does it take? It takes money, leadership, Leadership is in short supply, vision, uh, creativity, imagination, applications, uh, a little bit of star power behind talking about it. For instance, in the US, no really prominent famous person uh, who the average person would recognize has talked about it. In Japan, the prime minister has talked about it repeatedly. So all these things are happening in other places that used to happen here, like Thomas Edison would say, oh, this is going to be big, you know, electricity, direct current is going to be big. Oh, well, Tesla has this, okay, alternating current will be big. You know, he switched from thing to thing, but basically Edison's proclamations of what would be big in technology made the front page of the New York Times. And we had really famous people as early adopters of technology. Five times, um, J.P. Morgan's brown, brownstone in New York caught on fire because he was one of the beta testers or even alpha testers of electrical systems. How many famous people do you know using IPv6? Is Bill Gates? Is Eric Schmidt of Google using it? Or Sergey Brin or Larry Page? Or anybody who's really famous in technology using this today? You don't know and I don't know because they've never talked about it. So we actually don't have people who are famous and prominent going and leading new technologies. But Asia does. And it's partly why their growth rates are faster than ours. It's why we have a 3% growth rate now. And China has what really is more like a 10 to 12 percent growth rate, but it's reported as a 9 percent one because they don't want to make it seem like it's too big and people think they have inflation. Give, give me a quick bulleted list of sort of, I guess, a strategy for, for you know, bringing this new internet about. Well, my strategy has been to hold U.S. Internet Protocol Version 6 summits, U.S. IPv6 summits, and to invite prominent speakers like the chief information officers of the Army, the Air Force, uh, the DOD. Um, for the new one coming up, I invited Condoleezza Rice and Donald Rumsfeld, and to go and ask them to say, what do you think about the future of the Internet, and should the U.S. lead? Should we lead or should we follow? And the answer to most people, if you just ask them that question, is to say, oh, we should lead. And I say, okay, great. So the first thing I get people to do is to say we should lead and to get together and say that in front of other people. And the next thing um, my strategy has been to get uh, Congress to hold hearings. So there were hearings held on IPv6. And the title was based on an, an article I wrote. The title of the hearing was To Lead or Follow, uh, The Next Generation Internet and the Transition to IPv6. And those hearings led to... Um, the Office of Management and Budget mandating IPv6 for the federal government by June 2008. Now, what funding have they provided? Zero. So the next thing to do is to go to the Appropriations Committee and get them to put up some money. But part of the problem is you have a lot of companies that are zero stock growth companies. For instance, I'm sorry to say Cisco. Cisco's stock hasn't really moved all that much in the last few years. Microsoft, what is, when is the last time Microsoft stock took a big jump? And they don't really see themselves as growth companies anymore. They're not really growth companies in the same way they used to be. So they're not putting a lot of time and money and effort into this. And so what they're saying is to the federal government, they don't want to see a big insertion of government money because that means they won't be able to patent it, you know, own it, make it proprietary advantage. So effectively they say, oh, the government should stay out of it. And I had kind of a, a battle of words over a Department of Commerce study that was in limbo for a long time, but it was basically a collection of industry saying, oh, the internet is a free market, let's leave it to the market. Well, one thing we have to do when talking about the internet is recognize something really basic. The internet has never been a free market. The first $50 million was paid for by the US federal government. It never will be a free market because you have to allocate addresses and one big company could just simply buy the entire address space. Can you imagine, for instance, the zip code system being the intellectual property or patent of one company? perhaps an Iranian company or an Abu Dhabi company, it would make no sense. There are certain things like numbering systems, but also it's a technology. It's one of those things that's sort of um, an address in the physical world and an address in the digital world, if you combine it with GPS. 
And that is the kind of thing you need to keep out of the free market so that everybody has equal access to it. And there are ways of keeping addresses in reserve for people who are a little slow and won't be getting an address till 15 or 20 years from now. They have to have an address ready when they, when they come to start using this. So the big thing we need is funding, but what we need more than anything is for all the people who have vision, like all the speakers at this Accelerating Change Conference, to talk about how it can be used and to share that. Um, I, this is what I find interesting about this new internet, is it's, is it's so new that even it's not really even on the, uh, the radar screen of Werner Vinge or Ray Kurzweil or Rudy Rucker or, or any of these people. So it's one of those things that, that I would see as a uh, uh, basically the test. This is the test of whether we have the intellectual capacity to continue being a leader as a nation. I ultimately think that how we embrace IPv6 and thus the future of the internet is in fact the future not only of America but of Western civilization. If we can't take something that's this amazing, that's free, nobody owns it, it's there. You can go out and get 64 billion addresses right now if you want it. What do we do with that resource? That will determine whether we make the world that has the, the soft takeoff for artificial intelligence and intelligence amplification, or whether we, you know, all the stuff remains in books, but others take without anything remotely like our uh, conceptions of, of that g g human rights are given by God instead of by government. Uh, freedom of speech is important. Freedom of, religious is, uh, freedom of religion is important. Um, and I, I point this out because it's really important now. There are over 700 billion barrels of oil that are in the hands of dictatorships. In fact, most of them are religiously supported dictatorships, most of them in the Islamic world. And if you look at that, at $100 a barrel, you're talking about $70 trillion worth of profits. I mean, we're not talking you don't even have to build a big infrastructure to get all this money. And, uh, oh, I'm sorry, it costs $4 a barrel to extract it. Okay, so it's $66 billion, trillion dollars worth of profits. That's enough money to buy over 50% of every public company in the world. In fact, every public company that will ever exist now, because new companies can use their shares to buy old companies, 51% of all the corporate debt, and considering that all the elected officials in the world have campaign contributors, it's probably enough to buy 51% of all the elected officials in the world as well. So I would say that, that in, to some extent, that that game of, of freedom and democracy is already almost ready to be, to, to be taken over by a different system. And further, there are about 10 terabits per second of IPv4 internet packet consumption today. The US has this illusion that we have 50% of that, so five terabits per second. We don't, we have more like one terabit per second. So we have 10% of the world's internet traffic. Well, we have about almost 5% of the people, so we're basically only twice the internet consumption on average in the world. We used to be 100 times the average consumption in the, in the world. There are about one gigabit, there's about one gigabit per second of IPv6 consumption, but America has less than one-tenth of one percent of that. So the rest of the world is, has a 99.99 percent market share of this, as opposed to a 90 percent. So in fact, when you talk about the future of the internet, what you have to think about is America will have almost nothing to say about it, um, given the way that we've just simply treated it as a goose that lays a golden egg that will keep on laying those golden eggs if we just have the IETF have its little meeting every three months and not allow corporations or governments to be represented as big entities. As if it's all just a group of guys who can get together and talk about the problem. Um, ultimately, we haven't watched the fundamental core of what the internet is. And there's a saying from Robert Anderson that those who do not manage their assets to reflect their true value are inviting someone else to do it for them. Unfortunately, we haven't managed the future of the internet as a resource, and therefore the Chinese, and to a lesser extent the Japanese and the Koreans, but they'll be eventually absorbed into the greater uh, East Asian co-prosperity sphere version 2.0. So they'll all be basically one big network, and they'll have a trusted bubble over that, where everybody has end-to-end -end IPsec security, and we'll have our untrusted networks, which will be constantly broken into by Chinese government hackers, and who will want to keep their money in our banks, who will want to trade their stocks on our networks, who will want to do e-commerce over our networks. Ultimately, I think that the future of the internet is pretty grim for the United States relative to what it could be um, if we'd only managed it a little more carefully.